but hello everyone um, and welcome to this wonderful lecture series from the horror program at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, um, I'm the head of the horror course at the moment, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. So we're going to be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. So the University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university founded in 2017 and birthed in the basement of nightlife venues. So we're a non-profit and registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org on this website. You can also find loads of amazing other exciting programming times and events and also amazing lectures like this one that uh, are up on the Instagram and YouTube page. So I'm super excited today. We have Lawrence R. Harvey with us. So Lawrence is an actor based in Greater Manchester with a degree in fine arts and a master's degree in art and performance theory. Uh, he has a career encompassing performance art, theatre, TV and film, as well as spoken word recordings of the work of writers such as Edda Edgar Rampo. Thank you. <laughs> there might be a few names I can't pronounce. Arthur McChen. Macken. Macken. <laughs> and Roland Topor. Is that right? Roland Topor. Yeah. Thank you for Cadabra Records. So um, he's probably best well known for starring as Martin Lomax in The Human Centipede 2, Full Sequence and other, other films include Human Centipede 3, <coughs> Final Sequence, The Editor, Attack of the Adult Babies and Batman slash Punisher fan film 1986 as The Penguin. So Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us and yeah, we're looking forward to hearing your stories. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um... <coughs> So, I mean, I <laughs> was uh, invited to audition for the role of Martin Lomax in February 2010. So um, at this stage, The Human Centipede, the first film, hadn't come out on general release. It was doing the festival circuit and I'd heard about it as being this kind of body horror uh, film. Um, and a little bit of background to myself at this stage. Obviously, sort of grow, I had a huge sort of interest in film. I'd gone to college as a painter, wanted to get involved with film, but found I was completely inept at using the equipment. <laughs> and so ended up staying in the kind of time-based area by moving into performance art. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, my interest in film sort of remained throughout. And um, by the time that I was auditioning for um, Human Centipede uh, 2, I was, uh, I'd had an interest in sort of Hong Kong Category 3 films and um, Japanese splatter films like the Guinea Pig series and, uh, all Night Long 3, which is uh, of particular relevance here, because as Tom Six was, there was no script at the, at the audition, um, Tom Six was simply taking me through the, the film, sort of scene by scene, uh, and the character of Martin sort of reminded me of um, the kind of Lone Dove Syndrome characters in, Japanese uh, society. I mean, we hear of these individuals that are picked upon and then take revenge upon society, uh, both through true crime, but also in, obviously in uh, cinema. Um, and in particular, sort of All Night Long 3, um, the 1996 film uh, sort of struck me as having something similar to what Martin was going through, except the All Night Long trilogy is a very kind of um, uh, bleak. <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, I think Tom wanted the character of Martin to have, uh, to, for the audience to be sympathetic with the character. So I was presented with playing this character that's a social outsider. Um, he, uh, 
I didn't want to make him disabled or mentally incapacitated in a kind of traditional sense. It was more that every authority figure in his life sort of uh, mistreats him. So I thought about sort of, this is a character that's retreated into himself and uh, his obsession with the film, the human centipede film, then sort of spurs on the actions of, of the sequel. <clears throat> because obviously Tom's going after the, the traditional sort of argument against um, extreme cinema or violent cinema, or violence on film is that it's copyable. You know, if you watch it, you'll copy it. And so very much the story of the Human Telepid 2 is presenting that, but as a kind of Bronk Wignol over the top kind of black comedy kind of thing. Um, because, yeah, I mean, we don't have, not everyone has um, a surgical, uh, surgical equipment and a uh, supply of uh, nutrient bags to feed into the victims. But obviously, be Martin not being a surgeon and so on, everything gets very messy. So it gets <clears throat> very bloody. Uh, and one of the things that um, people were asking Tom whilst the human centipede, the first film, was on the festival circuit was um, it, that it wasn't gory enough. It wasn't... Um, did he not want to push it further in that way? And it, Tom kind of took it as a duh. And so, uh, but, but also wanted to maintain that kind of same black humor that's in the first film through into the second one, but taken in a different direction, more kind of over the top gore. Um, and, but to, to still have that kind of black humor. Um, so this sort of chimed with my viewing habits at the time, <laughs> and with particularly like the guinea pig films, um, like the, the kind of based on the work of a manga artist and um, they are sort of very gory. And there's a lot of the whole sub genre of Japanese splatter that's, uh, that was current in the kind of nineties uh, that, uh, kind of interesting to me. So, so when Tom was going through the script and recognizing elements of this in that, and then um, also of Society, the Brian Yunza film from the eighties, which I'd seen as a, a student. And um, yeah, so it was these kind of elements that I could recognize. And one of the things about watching the first film was that there's these elements of high art, highbrow uh, filmmaking and lowbrow filmmaking. So there's this, um, there's the references to Saulo, obviously, uh, Pasolini's film, and George Slusier's The Vanishing, um, as well as sort of giallo films and, and so on. So, it was that kind of that kind of always interested me. Tom's reference, you know, the um, both high art and low and lowbrow culture. Sorry. <coughs> I'm drying up a bit. Um, so, so yeah, we we were talking through, and I was getting excited by what he was saying. He was excited by what I was saying, what I was picking up on. And yeah, that was, I got cast. Um, they got in touch and gave me the parts at the same, or well, yeah, a few days later, so. So yeah, I mean, when we actually sort of came to make it, it was, um, I was very conscious of making Martin, there was this problem of making Martin both a monster and sort of sympathetic. And I, usually when you think about sympathetic monsters, there's a kind of, they're usually sort of hideous or deformed in some way. And then we see the humanity beneath that exterior. Um, so we think, think like the elephant man or 
Frankenstein's monster or Quasimodo. Um, <clears throat> there's this kind of grotesque outer shell, and then we glimpse a sort of so, yeah, a human spirit beneath. But to do that without makeup, then you have to make work out a, work out a strategy of how this character that does vi very violent actions um, still maintains uh, the audience's sympathy. So I was borrowing a lot when I was actually acting or working on the film. I was borrowing a lot from um, silent film and silent comedy um, because we see sort of Charlie Chaplin beating somebody over the head with a lion bar as he tries to escape and and we still maintain um, our sympathy with the little tramp, the Chaplin's character. Um, and it's because, because we know that he's picked upon or, or impinged upon by society and the figures around him. And so there was that kind of echo with between Martin and the Little Tramp, I think. So I was very conscious of trying to keep that uh, going. But it, <clears throat> but obviously there's a point where Martin, there's obviously a, po a point at the film where Martin, the audience's sympathy for Martin um, must sort of drop or be dissipated completely. And I think that, um, that moment in the film is the rape of the final uh, segment of the centipede or, yeah. <laughs> so another thing, uh, uh, I refer to them as segments rather than actors <laughs> or victims because I, my interpretation of Martin was that he's trying to, he's trying to please his fictional father character, father figure. Um, his own father is in, in the backstory of the film, his own father is in jail because of the sexual abuse committed upon Martin um, whilst he was growing up. So Martin fixates on the fictional character of Dr. Heiter from the first Human Centipede film as somebody that is kind of rich and successful and does this amazing thing in Martin's eyes. So, um, so Martin's trying to find some validation with his fictional father figure. Um, and his approach is obviously not, he's not a surgeon, so he's using uh, everyday objects. Um, but I, I sort of approached it more as um, Martin being a sculptor. Um, or you know, trying to make a work of art, and and I've always been interested in those elements of obsession and creation in cinema, um, particularly Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when everyone has the image, <clears throat> when several of the main characters have images of uh, the flat-topped mountain, Devil Devil's Mountain, I think. Uh, and they start obsessively drawing or sculpting that thing. Um, and in a way, sort of <clears throat> Martin's desire to create his own human centipede is uh, that kind of obsession and that kind of thing. But it, it's for validation and for trying to um, trying to obtain a father figure in my reading of Martin anyway. Um, so there was that going on and, and obviously, um, obviously what he's doing to, to get there is pretty um, cruel and, and offensive, but um, I think the audience follows Martin's point of view, um, partly because the audience see it as um, Martin's revenge on society or Martin's revenge on the people that bullied him. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of trope in, in horror cinema anyway, that kind of revenge, re 
you know, whether it's rape revenge or revenge of the, um, yeah, the father figure in the kind of death wish type scenario. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're meant to see Martin as the main protagonist and see and be encouraged to uh, see his, follow his revenge through. But obviously what he's doing is so bad that we need, the audience needs to, to wake up as it were and to be shocked out of its um, compl or complicity within it. So hence, I think the rape is a, a sort of key point of the film. But it's, the rape isn't just the rape of a, it's both the, the rape of an individual woman and the, it's also about Martin becoming one with his creation as well. And what's interesting about the way that the BBFC cuts uh, were applied to that scene is that they, the way that they cut out the sort of close one-on-one -on -one relationship between Martin and the woman that's at the back of the centipede, the way that they remove those means that it concentrates on Martin becoming one with the centipede. Hopefully it still reads, I think it still reads, even with the BBFC cuts, that it is you know, a personal attack against uh, an individual woman. Um, but I, th I don't think Martin sees it as an attack on an individual woman, even though that's what it is. Um, I very much, Ma Tom Six had talked about um, the psychology of people that have been abused and how often there's this kind of conflict, this kind of conflation of pain and sexuality um, as a result of that. And so most, like a lot of the sexual violence, sort of apart from the rape, I think all the sexual violence is by Martin against himself. Like the barbed wire scene, which is taken out of the BBFC cut, and the sandpaper masturbation scene, which is again taken out of the BBFC film. I mean, whilst we were filming it, I knew that those scenes would be taken out, uh, would be edited out by the BBFC into, to be able to secure a release. But yeah, I mean, in today's day and age where you can just go online and, and use a VPN and view it a, on a different server, from a different country, you can see it uncut anyway. Um, <clears throat> and you know, e even in when it, at the time it was released, people, even in the UK, it was released. Uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I'll deal with that when we get to the BBFC thing. But uh, anyway, so I think that there is this thing of Martin. Um, committing sexual violence against himself and the conflation of the two. Um, I, one of the things, I think one of the most horrifying things of the first film is the dehumanization of the individuals in The Centipede. Whereas in the second film, I think Martin views them as uh, art material uh, for his sculpture but they rebel and uh, undo his uh, work, as it were. Um, and so in the, the first film, we've seen as the loss of identity, whereas I think the second film could be read as the individuals reasserting their identity. Um, <clears throat> that's if you um, read it, all the events is happening because the ending is ambiguous and can be read in a, a variety of different ways. So if we assume that what we were watching is uh, reality, then then, um, then yes, I see it as the, the segments or the individuals that make up the segments of the centipede reasserting their individuality. Um, so, I mean, when we were filming it, Tom keeps everything light on set. Obviously, it's quite dark and grim 
and it's kind of gory and uh, horrible. <laughs> Um, so when, when we're filming, Tom keeps everything light on set and he, he'd go behind the camera and look at a setup or uh, and go, oh, that's so nasty in his Dutch accent. <laughs> and you knew you were doing something good. <laughs> so, um, but, it, you know, he could equally as be talking about the mold on the on the wall behind you or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean. So, so we we made everything was kept light on set. So by the end of filming, I thought we'd made this kind of splatter comedy in the, the kind of brain dead kind of sense. Um, so it was kind of light hearted, uh, fun, and uh, <laughs> a light hearted, fun splatter romp. Um, um, and you know Tom's own sort of sense of humor is quite sort of childish. <laughs> Hence, uh, I was directed to blow a raspberry when um, after injecting the members of the centipede with a laxative and seeing the uh, feces leak out of the attachment <laughs> of parts where they're attached, uh, I should be uh, Tom directed me to blow raspberries because he's kind of childish in that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's and <clears throat> and yeah. So so there there is this kind of big kid within Tom Six. Hence why uh, by the end of filming, I thought we'd made this kind of splatter comedy. So when we finally sat down and saw the finished edit uh, at the cast and crew screening, and it was in black and white, and there's this uh, industrial soundscape. Um, it's a lot darker and a lot more um, grim than uh, I thought we'd I, I thought we'd filmed. Um, but at the same time, that the, it has a power. Um, when we were watching it, I felt myself being pushed uh, back into my seats. Um, I think that was a kind of physical reaction I'd only had um, the last time I had sort of remembered having that was watching um, Once Were Warriors uh, in which the kind of domestic violence sort of comes out of nowhere as it were and is quite impactful. So I was um, pleased that we'd made a film that an audience couldn't passively uh, sit back and enjoy, that it was something that was uh, impactful. Um, but at the same time, I knew that the, the first film uh, had split opinion um, because whilst you're watching it, I, I think there is a constant, constant question of whether it's a bad film or whether it's satirizing bad films. And I think it's, I, I lean towards the latter, but I can see, I mean, it's obviously, obviously a low budget uh, film, so that comes with its own set of limitations. So yeah, I was pleased that we'd made this uh, impactful film and that, uh, I, but I knew that it would be, um, it would split the audience. Um, so we have to remember that this was released in 2011 and, with, with the first film, initially it was referred to as body horror, um, although it's not as, say, philosophical as, say, Do David Cronenberg's approach to body horror. Um, and it, as it became more popular, the first film, um, because it was only released whilst, just after we were filming it went on general release in the UK just after we, we, we finished filming the second film. Um, but by that stage already, there'd been the Facebook memes of people lining up as the three people in the centipede. Uh, and it had been on Beavis and Butthead in America and stuff like that. 
So it's starting to gain kind of um, a popular culture, um, a level of uh, a level of notoriety in popular culture, even as we were finishing making the second film. So when the second film came out, obviously it everyone was going on about how how uh, the Human Centipede was the worst film they'd ever seen, and so on. And so we knew that this was going to be more gross and more horrible. <laughs> um, but the, the the tone in what the human centipede, what the reaction to the human centipede was, started changing as it grew more and more popular. So it started getting lumped in with it within the torture porn genre or subgenre. Now the phrase torture porn was coined. Um, so I have. I can't remember his name. It's coined by uh, David Edelstein in um, in reference to sort of Hostel and Saw, and like uh, property, like like the terms property porn and food porn. It was about something that's glossy and expensive being sold to ordinary people as something. Um, yeah, something to, to get off on, as it were. Um, so, so to me, the, the torch porn thing didn't really sort of apply to us because we were, I think the film that we'd made was more in keeping with kind of low budgets, um, more kind of underground films. It was more akin to say something like Thundercrack or, um, or or even like Goshivata's Oshoi Hito, a uh, late bloomer, uh, 2004 Japanese film. So it was more, it was kind of black and white. It was kind of grim, um, although it has got a black sense of humor in it. But it's, yeah, it wasn't aiming for a kind of multiplex audience. It was very much directed at horror, audience um so i guess you could argue that it was a niche audience rather than a, a sort of general audience that it was aimed at now obviously that kind of changed as when uh we put it in for when we submitted it for rate being rated by the bbfc then they released a um initially they released a press release that was largely one person's uh, point of view uh, about Tom Six in general and saying that the film couldn't be cut to me to become a um, an 18 certificate film. So, it was, which was patently ludicrous. Um, and the luckily, uh, the distributor in the UK uh, was going to fight it. Um, it was distributed by, although it was sort of released under the sort of monster films, bounty pictures uh, label, it was being distributed by Eureka, who were uh, kind of distributing uh, monster pictures films and bounty pictures films at the time. So they, um, so they were going to mount a defence against the BBFC, uh, against the BBFC decision uh, in this and this press release in particular. <clears throat> now, I'd always been interested in having grown up and lived through the video nasties era um, as a kid, and sort of hearing like playground tales of the. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and stuff like that. I'd sort of been always been interested in um, in uh, censorship and, and cinema, and particularly sort of extreme cinema and the way that the censors deal with that. Uh, and we didn't have a we didn't have a VHS player at the time. 
uh, until after the uh, the the act, uh, the Video Recordings Act was uh, enabled. So uh, I didn't get to savor those delights. Uh, so the, the first time I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre set, for example, was um, was in the 1999 uh, re-release uh, when it was finally passed by the BBFC. Uh, it had been passed and then withdrawn uh, within a year of it uh, being released. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, it was, it was it, having lived through the, the uh, Video Nasties era and being interested in cinema censorship, to then be at the centre of this cinema censorship uh, debate that arose around uh, the Human Centipede 2. But also, um, I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that long prior to, it wasn't long after they'd banned the Japanese film Grotesque. Um, and it was around the same time that Human Centipede 2 and a Serbian film and the Bunny Game were all being dealt with by the BBFC at the same time. Um, we luckily, you know, I think the, Thanks to the support of Eureka, we, we, we did resubmit it and recut it, uh, not according to the guidelines because they weren't going to offer any guidelines for all cuts, but um, Eureka sort of just cut out the scenes of sexual violence of Martin against himself. So uh, you don't see my penis in... <laughs> in the BBFC version. Um, so, and sort of toned down, uh, they resubmitted it and then the BBFC sort of worked with Eureka to then cut down uh, the elements of the rape and, and some of the duration of things like the teeth uh, scene and so on. So eventually we did get a release uh, same with a Serbian film that got edited for the for the UK release, uh, but uh, the Bunny Game just didn't get uh, was banned outright, like grotesque had been previously. So that's the sort of context of the BBC's uh, reception of the film. Um, but the BBFC press release had led to. Um, Australia, where it had been passed and cut, uh, Christian Voice Australia or Family Voice Australia sort of got um, hold of the, saw the press release from the BBFC online and decided to uh, launch an appeal against, uh, against the Human Centipede 2 being released and cut in Australia. Uh, and so then it had to go to an appeals board and Bounty Pictures and Monster, Monster Films, uh, they, um, with the support of various academics and so on, um, argued for, uh, for it to be released with minor cuts. So I think in the UK, it was like three minutes, 30, that was cut in Australia, it's literally the two glimpses of penis you see. So I think it's like 10 seconds, 12 seconds that's cut from the film. Um, I know like online it's sort of, or when you hear about the human said P2 on, or read about it online, it said it was banned in the UK, that, that never happened. Um, and, you know, particularly in America, it was sort of, you see American commentators saying how badly it was cut in, in the UK, but the US, uh, the US theater release of the Human Centipede 2 was cut by three, <coughs> three minutes, 46, <coughs> three minutes, 46 
seconds. So it was a longer, there was more, more cuts in the US cinema release than there were in the UK release. Um, but in America, you've always got that thing of you can release an unrated version on uh, disc, on home video. But then um, nowadays we have um, uh, streaming services and Netflix and Amazon both present an edited version of the film. So you're probably, to see the uncut version, you're probably going to go either buy uh, an, uh, an uncut version or watch it on a dodgy streaming site, not technically legal <laughs> streaming site. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, it, it sort of became this cause celeb for a, a, a little bit. Uh, right now, I should start answering questions, I guess. Lawrence, thank you so much. Yeah, it's so, so interesting understanding the character a little bit more. And um, I can see questions popping up in the side. So yeah, yeah. Um, James, is your is your mic not working? No, okay. I, I'm gonna read out James's question, which is the first one. So uh, James asked, as an actor, what do you do to get in into character right before <coughs> filming a very intense scene like some of the ones that you've mentioned today? Well, with, with Martin, because he isn't a social character, it's very much about sort of going into a corner and just focusing on what happened. I mean, obviously, because you don't necessarily shoot in order. <laughs> uh, so you've got to remember what happened just before that scene and, and so on. So when I got the script, obviously, there's no lines for Martin, but... I was writing uh, in the margins about sort of the emotional things that are happening to um, to Martin uh, as the scene progresses, and then carrying that over onto the the next scene. So, so it it was very much about just going into a corner and, and just remembering what led into this scene, what the focus of this scene is for Martin and Martin's emotional or psychological journey through that scene. Um, you uh, can't method, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, no one ever method acts for horror films, right? <laughs> um, well, I mean, legally, I have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, there are, so, um, I mean, there's emotional recall and stuff like that, you know, like, um, so, you, you know, you might imagine this, uh, um, you might try and put yourself into a, a, a memory that where you were very angry at something um, and, so on, and build up for that, but uh, that's, that's literally all you do. You can't, you can't go up and kill somebody at the, uh, right now and how to do it. Yeah, so there's a, there's a question from Leila in the side. Leila, do you wanna? Thank you for the, for the lecture, super interesting. Uh, I just had a question. I rem was reminded by this lecture by Simona Fansarlos, this philosopher, and uh, they talked about anal terror, this particular text by Paul Preciado, a uh, Portuguese uh, philosopher also, talked a lot about gender identity and porn mm -hmm. um so i was interested <clears throat> the character's relation to the anus or like orifices as a a point also what you were saying about this dismantling the pater paternal figure um as the anus is also something that uh in this text and lecture is an ungendered mm, body part um and also the trauma that the character faced as a child, like the closing of the hole, let's say. I was just wondering if there's like a reference, a symbolic relation to holes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, the whole, why, why it is kind of 
mouth to anus is because it's a tr trying to the human centipede the, the concept of the human centipede is that it is one um digestive system so it passes from one to the other and the mouth and the anus are kind of echoes of one another in a way you know have you seen the the spanish film skins the pls well, yeah with the woman with the anus for a mouth there. yeah i couldn't get far but i i remember the poster instinctively yeah i mean that's an interesting and surreal uh, thing but it uh, you know i think there's echoes of that in sort of uh, tom's ideas about uh <clears throat> about the human centipede but um in terms of of it being yeah i, I so i'm i'm I don't think I don't think Martin's is is afraid of pe <laughs> anal penetration <laughs> because he, I mean he gets the obviously he's been abused by his father and, and he gets the centipede inserted into his anus at the end uh, towards the end of the film. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's any particular. Uh, yeah, I, I I I see it more as kind of Lego bricks, <laughs> and you know, uh, in the the way things interconnect, rather than it being a particular site of importance in um, Martin's mind or or the concept of the human centipede. So I just think it's, see it as interconnection. Yeah, I mean, the, the, obviously, there's a sexual thing as well, and a digestive thing as well as a digestive thing in that sense of interconnectedness but um but yeah beyond that i, I think it's it, it it is literally just the obvious it's not uh, it's not it doesn't hold particular significance for the character so in, in my in my opinion you know other people might have a different view Um, yeah, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for your uh, uh, talk. Um, I was wondering if uh, you were maybe hesitating to play this character at first. And as an actor, can you play <clears throat> everything? Or are, do you have, like, how do you decide what you want to play and what you don't want to play? And if you were, like, yeah, hesitating in this role, for this role? Um, no, I, I mean, you know, at the audition, we got on, uh, I got on with Tom uh, really well. And, you know, for, for me, because I was kind of used to the kind of films that I watch, <laughs> um, it, the, the nature of the role didn't uh, frighten me at all or didn't intimidate me at all. Um, I mean, it, it was, it's sort of, obviously it's a big ask or to step up to be the lead character in the film, but that's just, you know, the knowledge of, of the weight you have to bear in that role. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm a character actor and so on, so I think I'd be more intimidated by playing a... a, a, a uh, um, action hero or, or or a romantic lead. I think that would be far more intimidating because it's a bigger stretch. I think. Um, yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Go on. Come here. Uh, I also have a question. Like the um, so like the first one is really like a kind of classic in a way. Mm -hmm. And the second one went uh, really way, uh, yeah, it was way more radical in his uh, approach. Yeah. And I was also, there is always this kind of a meta uh, point of view of the movies. Like the second one is actually like someone that, <coughs> the fan of the first movie, right? 
Yeah. Um, and then, like the third one, the third one is also kind of the even. The other two films that. are films within the third one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like and like the the last one, like in my memories, oh. like, because I watched it like a kind of a long time ago. I remember that uh, there is a lot, like a lot more humor. In a way, yeah. almost like yeah. making not fun, but like a, you know, like a kind of a gift, you know, to like a, the the first viewers of the first movies. And I was wondering if you liked more like the second film, like the very radical, very dark approach, or like the more like humoristic one, like almost caricatural uh, approach from the last film. <coughs> I mean, I, I, I think I prefer the second film just because I like films like that. Um, darker, um, and more, uh, well, the humor is kind of black humor and so on. But um, I think that the, the, the third film, uh, I think the, the third film, I think feels less personal. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I like the way that Tom um with each film he sim he, he doesn't simply reiterate <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh. <coughs> sorry he doesn't simply re reiterate the concept for each film it, it takes it in a very different direction um so the the second film is very much about the audience reaction to the first film uh in that um <laughs> in that it's very much geared towards the horror audience and make seeing their reactions and then wanting more and then giving them more than that they can handle I think uh, that's that's what I like about the second film the third film obviously there's an expectation for it to go even more gorier or more extreme or whatever and it takes it in a different way it sort of it doesn't fulfill the expectations of what the previous film leads you to in, in each each of them i think so with the third film it's more about political incorrectness uh and i think viewing the i think i didn't the third film, I think, has only uh, increased in its kind of satirical nature uh, with after four years of Trump, because there's so much in there that it is about the Trump years, even though it was made in 2013. The whole sort of flag hugging and the person of German descent sort of claiming they're more American than anybody else uh, and so on. So th th they're all, they're all these things that are very much about Trumpism in the third film, even though it was made three years before he came to power. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I, lo I like all three, but I, I think the second one's my favorites. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the first one is kind of a traditional mad scientist film uh you know with all those kind of tropes of women getting lost in the woods and going from the frying pan into the fire you know so it's it's very tropey the second one i think is more uh it's it, it, in some ways it's more simple but in some ways it's more effective you know um and the third one i think yeah, it, it just, it improves with age. <laughs> but yeah, it is very much a comedy, the third one. It was always set out to be um, much more of a broader comedy than than the comedy in the other two, so yeah. Mm. And like, um, like, like the defense, like of the settings, you know, like, uh, like I'm, I'm very curious, like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, like I have to have more details on, uh, what does what does like a, like a setting on these kind of movies are looking like, and like could you say a bit more between the difference between the like the two and the three, for instance, like in terms of I don't know <coughs> the general mood on stage. Well, I mean the 
the first films in this kind of clean, modernist, very European, uh, or, or sort of, I mean, it was filmed on the border between Holland and Germany, and it's kind of got that, it's not really one country or another, it's kind of got this indeterminate, kind of European modernist, but it's kind of indeterminate. Whereas I think the second film feels very much like very, very British and very <laughs> grim and uh, and grimy and, and almost kind of London specific, I think. And then the third film is very American, uh, very American. And, but also it's kind of American, it feels like an American TV thing in that the, the sets look very much like daytime TV sets. Uh, and the exteriors are very much the kind of, uh, you know, hot California sun and desert and so on, which are very uh, specific. So, <clears throat> Like the the all the spaces in the second film that we were shooting were kind of you know small and British sized. <laughs> the American film was much bigger on a much bigger scale. With uh, you know, apart from the interior sets, which were on a small sound stage, the the exteriors and the location shoots were all very much kind of massive pr massive prisons. We shot in three different prisons and they're all huge, huge places. <clears throat> and the, the exteriors of the prison were shot uh, obviously in the desert, but it was near where the hut was that's used in uh, The Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, so it's, it's not far from there, um, but yeah, it, and the scale of, like you could look out onto the at the horizon and you couldn't see any other buildings. Uh, you know, maybe you'd see a car in the distance. But that, that was about it. Yeah. And obviously, we had a lot more. Um, <clears throat> we had like hundreds of extras on the third film as well. So it was the scale of everything was just much bigger on the third film. We probably have time for one more question and then yeah, yeah. Um, has anyone got a final question? Maybe this is super random, but did you get nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no. Um, no, I, you know, I, I think I had very rarely dream, and the ones that I do remember are usually about Sudoku for some reason. It's, it's just a, it's a stress, real nightmare. The stress of doing <laughs> Sudoku. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm tormented by. I, I think, that, yeah, if somebody asked me to do a Sudoku film, I, I'd then be worried, worried and obsessed. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, Lawrence, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been amazing hearing Now I'm thinking all. of all the things that I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking about Chris Dava and, and trying to make the leaky body and trying to make Martin a, a, a leaking body uh, throughout the film with spittle and, and phlegm and sweat and blood and semen and obviously poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's amazing how I found it really interesting that you were saying this like the you know Martin's been failed by society and has no support and then in the third film it's like you suddenly change sides and as being the one that's abused and then you're well you're I know you're the <clears throat> you end up being the abuser but the in the third film you're in the institution that's yes he's part of the institution and it's it's Dwight in the third film. He everyone sort of sees him as being sympathetic, but he's the real villain because it's his idea. So, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, well, it's the banality of evil. It's it's the. I mean, Tom was very much 
uh, interested in the idea of it's it's the logistics that uh, were the evil part of the um, Nazi sort of final solution. And so it was trying to apply that to a comedy situation <laughs> in very bad taste, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have one final question, Bianca. It might have to be a quick yep. one. But... Yes. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, um, it came now, because like we're consuming so many like also horrific images and there's so many different ways to show these <coughs> disgusting things. Do you think um, it's difficult, it gets more and more difficult to create like shocking images or do you think we're getting like immune uh, yeah, to them? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you can become immune to shocking images and I think the internet hasn't uh, helped that. I think, um, or has only kind of accelerated that immunity as it were. Because when, if you look at, say, those disturbing movie icebergs, you'll, you'll, sit, you'll, fuck, you'll see that the lower layers are full of, like, compilation, um, uh, what do they call it? Well, anyway, comp compilation uh, films that are, are just clips from the internet, like the MD Pope movies and so on. It's, it's just, <clears throat> if you scour the internet for any length of time, you find out you'll find things that are much worse than what's in the human centipede or something. So I would argue that yes, to specific images, you become inured, but what uh, I still think cinema has the power to do is to provide a context that makes uh, things that you've probably seen in a, a, a thousand other places, um, it makes them impactful. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, if we're talking about the violence, if we look at, say, um, uh, what's the uh, young, sorry. I'm trying to think of the Tony, the scene with Tony the Young at the end of House of Flying Daggers. <clears throat> the whole film's a sort of, you know, sword play, wushu film. And then at the end, in the final, battle there's not nothing that you've seen beforehand because you've seen these beautiful balletic and sort of you know deadly sort of sword play uh duels and so on um but the most violent scene is when in the final battle he loses his sword and he hits the other person in the face with his fist and it's just one punch but the impact of that it's much more powerful than the thousand punches you see thrown in a barroom brawl scene in a Western or whatever, you know. So, so I think it's about impact and about sort of how to, I think cinema still has, uh, still has the power to, um, to shock and to uh, bring the audience out of complacency by recontextualizing and, and, um, and dis displaying sort of violence within uh, a thing where you, you get the emotional, you see the emotional and <clears throat> sort of intellectual context of it. Uh, and I think that's what provides the shock, not the actual image itself. I think that's what cinema still has above uh, random clips on the internet. So even though we're kind of becoming inured to all sorts of things through the internet. But uh, I still think there is a, a place for extreme cinema. So there we go. Or, or a place for violence in cinema. So there we go. Thank well, thank, you. That was a very good question. So much. That was a great way to end, I think. <coughs> Bianca, thanks. That's a wonderful question. And Lauren's great. If anyone wants to see any more of, well, see, hear well, <laughs> any more of Launcher's work, Kadabra Records, right? Is a good place uh, Yes, to yeah. Uh, what I'll do is I'll provide um, some of the films I've mentioned, I'll write up and I'll type up uh, a suggested reading and viewing. Um, and I'll put a link to Kadabra Records on that. I'll send that over to you later today. If 
that's okay I think. that would be absolutely wonderful thank you so yeah I, i'll try and sort out some horrible nastiness for you to watch <laughs> <laughs> fabulous thanks thanks thank okay. you